In this and in later sections, we will take a look at how cells respond to DNA damage. Okay, this slide is a bit overwhelming. You won't have to know the bulk of things going on in this slide. But in learning about the process of DNA replication, we did learn that the progression of the cell through the cell cycle, G1, S, G2, and mitosis, requires the activity of cyclin-dependent kinases. These are in turn controlled by their cyclin partners that are mainly shown here in green. The activity of the cyclin-dependent kinase enzymes are controlled by many upstream signaling influences. Some of these are positive pathways and others are checkpoint regulators that inhibit these pathways. It's these type of checkpoint pathways that get activated with DNA damage and will block the activity of the cyclin CDK complexes. These are known as cell cycle checkpoints. Cell cycle checkpoints occur at each of the major transitions from one phase of the cell cycle to another. If damage has occurred, these checkpoints get activated and will block the progression of the cells to the next phase of the cell cycle. This will give the cell time to restore or correct damaged DNA before it moves through the cell cycle. This is really important if the DNA has not already undergone replication. You really want to have time to repair the DNA before it goes through the replication process. However, if DNA damage is too extensive and cannot be adequately repaired, the cell also can activate the process of apoptosis or programmed cell death. By initiating the death of a few highly damaged cells, the organism can remain intact and healthy rather than risk the harmful effects of the cellular mutations. In a multicellular organism, the strategy of getting rid of a few damaged cells is a very good one. You don't see this same strategy in unicellular organisms. They have to try to salvage themselves regardless. So once the cell cycle has been stopped, DNA repair processes will then have time to repair the damaged DNA prior to DNA replication. The first type of repair process that we'll take a look at is mismatch repair. The importance of mismatch repair systems is exemplified by the fact that the system is highly conserved in all major organisms on the earth from archae species such as Thermus thermophilus to bacterial species to fungi all the way up to Homo sapiens and other eukaryotic organisms. In bacterial systems, mute S and mute L proteins begin the process of mismatch repair. During the replication process, DNA polymerase enzymes make an error about once every million bases and they insert the wrong nucleotide into the DNA sequence. So here you can see that the normal DNA sequence contains a GC pair right here, and then following replication, uh-oh, the DNA polymerase has put in the wrong base. Now there's a mismatch, and instead of seeing GC, there's a GT base pair. So the mute S protein will go along and it will scan the newly synthesized DNA and it will look for these mismatches within the sequence. When it finds one, like it has here, the mute S protein will recruit a homodimer of the mute L protein that's bound to two molecules of ATP. ATP hydrolysis is used to be able to nick the strand that has the incorporation of the mismatched base. So how does it recognize which strand is the daughter strand and which strand was the template strand? It's thought that one mechanism used to identify the daughter strand is the presence of nicks in the Okazaki fragment. The mismatch repair system may be able to use these nicks to identify which strand is the daughter strand and which strand is the template strand. It then will place a nick in the daughter strand near the mismatch. Once the nick is in place, an endonuclease is activated that will remove bases on the NIC strand near that vicinity. So depending on which side of the NIC the mismatch is located, the endonuclease may mediate 3' prime to 5' prime excision and go backwards and remove that base, or 
it may use 5' prime to 3' prime excision and go forward to remove that base. The result is the same, or a DNA fragment that has had the bases removed in the vicinity of the mismatch damage, effectively removing the ill-incorporated base. A DNA polymerase enzyme, such as DNA pole 1, will then be involved in the repair of the single-stranded region, followed by ligation of the backbone by the DNA ligase. You can see that by looking at the different pathways in the different domains of life, from eukaryotes to bacteria, that there is high conservation of the mismatch repair process. Lynch syndrome, often called hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, or HNPCC, is an inherited disorder that increases the risk for many types of cancer, particularly cancers of the colon or large intestine and rectum. Changes in genes involved with mismatch repair, such as the MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, PMS2, or EPCAM genes, have been found in people with Lynch syndrome. In the slide on the left is a light microscope image of a colonic epithelium from a tumor in a patient that has HNPCC. On the right is a normal epithelial layer from a normal colon. You can see in the normal slide that there is a high degree of organization in this colonic fold. You can see the outer edge of the fold region. This is known as a basement layer and it separates the colonic epithelium, which is shown here, from the underlying tissue layer, which is consisting of fibroblasts, blood cells, and then muscle tissue as well that underlays the colonic epithelium. The inside of the colon would be in this fold in this region here. And at the bottom of this crypt, because you have a lot of folds in the colonic epithelium, You've got these little crypts down here um, where you have cells that are actively growing in the epithelial chambers. These are called panis cells, and they contain a lot of these small little granules that you see here that get released into the colonic epithelium. And these little granules contain things like antibiotics that help fight infections. They're stained in dark pink in this diagram. In the tumor sample, on the other hand, you can see one of these colonic folds here. And look at the epithelial layer. It's a little bit crazy, isn't it? So you can see here that there is a single layer of cells. The nucleus is stained dark purple here, and each epithelial cell will extend up to the edge of, to the lumen of the colon. So you can see here that you've got all of these nuclei that are kind of stacked up all over the place. And you can see that during tumorigenesis, you've got really rapid reproduction of these cells, right? So they're not forming a nice single layer of colonic epithelium around uh, the lumen here, creating a nice crypt. They are starting to get really stacked up on each other, especially at the base of the crypt where they're growing faster and they're creating this tumor inside the body. They're growing disproportionately and crowding out the basement tissue. And you also don't see a very nice basement layer that separates the under tissue from the epithelial layer. It starts meshing together and you can see that those epithelial cells maybe are starting to escape into the surrounding under layer or um, fibroblast muscle tissue layer. There's also no clear bottom of the crypt as in the normal tissue. And one last thing that you can see is the infiltration of lymphocytes from the immune system into the area that is trying to repair this damage or respond to this damage. So the host's immune system is trying to recognize this tumor and attack it. Overall, this highlights the importance of mismatch repair. If those damaged bases from normal replication processes are not repaired, you can get transitions and transversions that can start altering genes that are involved in the formation of cancers. And so over a lifetime, 
This can cause an accumulation of mutations, which will lead to tumor genesis. 